Welcome to the High Performance Hockey Podcast. Today, we're joined by the head strength and conditioning coach for the Arizona Cardinals and the National Football League, Buddy Morris. Buddy recently won the 2021 Strength and Conditioning Coach of the Year Award in the National Football League as voted on by the Professional Football Strength and Conditioning Coaches Society. He's in his eighth year with the Arizona Cardinals, previously with the Cleveland Browns from 2002 through 2004. Buddy returned to the NFL in 2014 with the Cardinals after working at the collegiate level for 19 years. He's a native of South Park, Pennsylvania, with an extensive background in strength and conditioning dating back to his first job at his alma mater, University of Pittsburgh, where he began his coaching career in 1980 in the first of three stints with the Panthers. He worked with the Panthers from 1980 to 89 and aided in the development of the future Pro Football Hall of Famers Dan Marino, Ricky Jackson, Chris Dolman, and Russ Grimm. During that period, Buddy worked with 13 first-round NFL draft picks and 15 first-team All-Americans. Very, very interesting conversation. You might think, what is a national football strength and conditioning coach doing on a hockey podcast? And uh, Buddy uh, has been a a mentor of mine for a long time. And it's actually the first time I had the opportunity to speak with him. But it's just a wealth of knowledge. I've learned so many things from Buddy over the years regarding program design, speed development. And I wanted to have him on the podcast because I think his message can certainly be scaled to multiple sports, including the sport of elite ice hockey. Today, we speak about his experience in strength and conditioning, uh, what a good coach is, physiology, speed, and it's really a very very interesting conversation. I ask one question, Buddy goes on for 10 minutes. I ask another and it, it's returned. So it's a fantastic conversation. Thrilled to have Buddy on the podcast. Welcome in. Welcome to the podcast, Buddy. Thanks so much for joining us. Anthony, I, I, I truly appreciate the time. And it's an honor to me when you reached out and asked me to do the podcast. I really got to thank you uh, for the book you sent me. Uh, the inscription meant a lot to me. Uh, you know, you gave me an opportunity to learn more. And as you and I discussed before I came on, I love to talk to other coaches, preparation coaches for other sports to get their insight on how they prepare the athletes for the demands of that particular sport. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, and I've become very good friends with Brotherhood with Corey Schlesinger, the head strength coach for the Phoenix Suns. And he and I will get together periodically when time permits. And it just amazes me how he prepares his athletes and what I can learn from him, even though he is in another sport. You got to understand this. And there's so much information out there. And there's so much to learn. One thing I've realized is I know the extensiveness of what I don't know. I also know this. We're all individuals. We don't all respond to the same to the same program. And if you think about this, I tell people two things. Number one, if you never want to get injured, don't be an athlete. (laughs) (laughs) Because the first time an injury appears or teams get injured, the first people, the first person that gets the finger pointed is the preparation staff. And the people who are pointing the fingers have no clue about the environment of the world we exist in, especially in the NFL. And I'm sure in hockey, from the end of the season till we start our off season, which is April 18th, I can't touch my guys. I have no communication with them, not allowed. Now, they can come in the weight room and they can lift, and we're now allowed to supervise them in the weight room. We can send out programs, but I can tell you this, most guys don't do them. They hire their own personal terrorists because <laughs> they like to be entertained instead of true entertained. We're not allowed on the field with them. And the last time I looked, the sport of football, American football, requires an awful lot of running. We can't go on the field with them. The only thing we can do do is be in the weight room, which is the number one mistake I think everybody makes in this country is we put too much emphasis on the weight room. Too much. And there comes a point in time where chasing maximum effort strength is a waste of time. And people forget that there are multiple ways for an athlete to get stronger. There is not one exercise you and I or any strength coach in the world will ever do or ever come up with as far as uh, dynamic correspondence or being specific to a sporting activity that will mimic the forces incurred in max velocity. I mean, max velocity makes use of motor units that aren't accessible by any other means. 
And think about it, the forces that are produced, especially look at the same bolt, eight one hundred hundreds of a second on the ground and 100 meters, the forces are produced in the weight room. As weight goes up, velocity does what? It comes down. It goes down, yeah. What am I going to do? Have somebody stand on one leg and put 1,400 pounds on their back and have them bounce around? <laughs> it's not going to It's not going to happen. So people forget about med ball throws. Why go out and push a heavy prowler? Am I not strengthening my lower limbs, my lower legs? I'm actually strengthening the entire body because I hold my arms straight out in front, the static contraction in the upper back and the arms and the shoulders and the upper torso to move as I dynamically move my legs has to be accounted for. So I think, you know, there's so much to be learned. I, I liken every human being to a tire. Some of us are Pirellis. Some of us are Michelin's. Some of us, some of us are bargain basement big O tires. But the bottom line is this. Every tire has a tread. The life of that tread depends on do you keep it properly inflated? Do you rotate your tires? Do you align your car? What's the environment I, I drive in? Do, am I an accelerator? Do I have a heavy foot? Am I a hard breaker? But all those factors contribute to the life of the tread. But eventually, over time, that tread's going to wear out. I don't care what you do. So the life of that tread, and we go back to the injury equation, is dependent not on me. It's dependent on you. It's your tread. How do you sure. take care of it? When my guys leave this building, I don't know what they do. Right now, we're in a dead zone. I don't know if anybody started to train right now. Guys hire these personal terrorists or gurus on the mountains. They're so, so many generations removed from what we're trying to accomplish. Then they come back. Now they got to adapt to our stressors. So they never get a chance to enhance upon the quality because, let's face it, social media has ruined America. They're oh. more concerned about Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, and Facebook and being on there than they are true training. I always tell my guys when they come back for OTAs and now the primary application is the Velma Sporting Activity, which is technical, technical, and psychological components. And people have to account for psychological components because the brain is the greatest user of energy is now the forces incurred on the field cannot compete with the forces incurred away. They, they can't compete. So when my guys come back, number one, I have to correct a lot of things that haven't been done or taken care of. They have to understand, and I tell these guys, your fitness level, or what we call, everybody's talking about raising chronic workload, that's directly proportional to the amount of time it took you to acquire it. So if you sat on your ass, for four months, and now I just decided to train, you're going to be in a world of hurt because don't ever talk to me about getting stronger during in season, yeah. especially on the elite level. The forces and outputs are so great. So the, as, as, as an athlete evolves or as an athlete advances in levels and masters their sport, obviously sees their outputs are greater and greater. There's a cost for those outputs. Sure. I have to ask myself this. Do I want my outputs to be specific or general? Because you have so many resources on the body for recovery and for energy. It's finite. It's not infinite. So I can't rob Peter to pay Paul. I can't say, you know what, on Mondays after a game, everybody got to come in and got to put 405 on the bar. That's absurd. Sure. Now I'm tapping into the ability to recover because these guys really don't start recovering. And you can see it till Wednesday. So uh, my job in season is just sub-maximum work because I don't want to compete with the primary stressor, especially on the elite level. It's it's interesting. We talk about complement versus compete, and I know Dan Faf says management versus development. Um, in, in the National Hockey League, you're you're playing an 82 game schedule, so as you can imagine, that's like drinking water through a fire hose and the stress response. Yep. Uh, what we see with our athletes is body comp uh, heading north, uh, cortisol, uh, body fat increasing, uh, strength decreasing, because obviously we're not trying to. You know, the most important thing is the game at that time, yep. um, and uh, it, it's very interesting uh it's very interesting to see uh in terms of um the similarities in sport one of the things that caught what you talked about uh you know the master athletes it was a heuristic that i actually uh came up with based on 
your work actually. And, and, and it's, you, you talked about this in a Robbie Bork podcast a while ago, talking about power outputs and how simple programs can work for beginner athletes and advanced athletes, but for different reasons, different reasons, right? And what yeah. that, it was, it was a huge aha moment for me. I'm not joking when I tell you this, uh, buddy. I literally pulled over it. Like it's a it's a huge part of my book. And the heuristic that I came up with is like it's like playing the guitar, right? You want to get good at playing the guitar. You want to be a virtuoso at playing the guitar. You got to play the damn guitar. No one would say, you know, work all summer on your or work all season on your finger strength and then go play in front of an orchestra. You got to play the guitar. Having said that, though more more load more need for rest right a ferrari engine is very different than a golf cart engine if they both hit it if they both hit a tree (laughs) one ain't walking away (laughs) could you could you expand on that a little bit more that 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 quote that you used with the robbie bork this this idea of simple for both a beginner and an advanced athlete but for different reasons people forget that uh the simplest things have the most profound influence on the human body Again, I point to as we become elite athlete, as you advance in stages and you achieve the highest level of competition, your force outputs are the greater. If you look at motor learning, last stage of motor learning is unconscious competence. It just happens. You know, I, I love when coaches come to me and say he's slow. He's not slow. It's that mentally he's not processing very quickly because he's, he's overloaded or he can become uh, what's the word I'm looking for? they can become very tight because they become very anxious from all the things they're trying to learn. When rookies come in here, their head's on a swivel. You know, they're now starting to understand, oh boy, this I'm getting paid to do. And if you think about it, the human brain doesn't mature to the age of 25. Last part of the human brain to mature is a prefrontal, prefrontal cortex, which is where all the adolescent behavior is stored. Sure. So you get all these young rookies in the first three to four years when they're here. To me, they're adolescents. They're still children. You have to teach them. One of the things we talk about, and my assistant, Evan Louder, who does all our um, force play testing and catapult testing, talks to the rookies about is about establishing habits. I talk to them about taking care of your body. We make sure that when the first 24 to 48 hours from following a game or leading into a game, that these guys are all hooked up with some type of massage work, some tissue sure. work. We teach them that you don't need, with the exception of massage now, you don't need all this fancy recovery stuff in the off season. The only time we pre- prescribe recovery methods here is obviously to restore autonomic function or an autonomic balance uh, during a block of recovery work, which mm-hmm. after OTAs, we go through mandatory mini camp, Anthony, and it's very intensive work. I mean, there's four practices, two practices a day. So they're on their feet all day and their primary concern is the sporting activity. So there's really nothing done in the weight room, to be honest with you. We may do some mobility and recovery work, but that's it. So there'll be a block of training that's designed to help promote recovery. And we use modalities. And then obviously during a competitive uh, season, I think people, you got to let the body do its job at some point in time. Sure. The inflammation, uh, the hormonal disruptions, this is why we were trained, actually trained for hormonal response the metabolical stress and the enzymatic changes are all part of the adaptation phase. When are you going to let the body do its job? If you don't, if you're just laying on a table, I had one of our players come to me this year. I spent a lot of money taking care of my body in the off season. I'm like, really? You don't prepare very well, but I spent all this money. I said, what are you spending on? Massage, cupping, dry needling. I'm like, I did not hear one word about strength. I did not want to hear one word about the bomb of alactic power and capacity. And you come to me and you tell me, the day of camp, the day we go to camp, I need a strength in my hamstrings. My first question is, what the fuck were you doing the last six months? Yep. And on the table, that's where you spent your money. So we have to understand that, you know, those methods are great, but over time, like anything, law of accommodation, they're going to lose their effectiveness. Three sure. things that don't lose it, what I've talked about all my life is sleep, hydration, and nutrition. But you know what? They're not fancy. Don't not sell. sexy. Yeah. And you know, you know, Anthony, we are a very gimmick oriented society. Oh, yeah. Winston Churchill said a little oh. one of my favorite quotes is by Winston Churchill. Americans will always figure it out after they've tried everything else. We are nothing but gimmick oriented, latest greatest gadget we're looking for the top secret double probation never seen before exercise we're looking at all the stand on a bosom ball blindfold with somebody throwing darts on me with a band in my hand that's cool that's really not that that's really not going to transfer that's really not effective in fact to me the greatest form of transfer is the actual practice of the sport with great intention absolutely you want to train specifically to sport play sport all year round 
But getting back to that quote I made, you know, these guys, their outputs are so great. I just stay very general because they're, the only way they're going to get better is to develop, continue 100%. to practice, continue to work on. There, you have to become a PhD in your sport. Yep. When you're very young and you can't produce much force and unconscious incompetent, you have no idea what you're doing in sporting activity. You know that. Yep. But, but going back to the tire analogy, too, I always tell people, you look at these guys, it's accumulation of trauma over time. People say, well, you know, he's been playing football since 12 years of age. By the time he gets to the NFL, it's 10 years of trauma. How much trauma does a 12-year-old get in current? I said, look at the context. As for a 12-year-old, that's a lot of trauma when they run headfirst into each other. And sure. every level, the forces increase. So I looked at, you know, the athletes and their outputs, and I see them with catapult. Like, I'm not going to get real fancy in here. You can either be fancy or you can be intense. You can't be both. <laughs> but everybody wants to be fancy. Uh, yeah. You look at why people get injured, athletes get injured. Number one reason to me is the volume of work they're asked to do. It's, it's interesting, and I'm not, I'm not trying to interrupt. It, it was another interesting aha moment that reinforced your quote. By It was an article written by Boo Schexnader talking about this idea oh. in track and field, why there's injuries as juniors and seniors as compared to freshmen and sophomore, and it's a volume issue, and they have more power output yeah. at that time. And essentially, this, it's not as simple. It, it's... Yeah. Those, those are why the injuries are occurring, at least his hypothesis. And obviously, he's had a lot of experience. <laughs> yeah, I think volume is number one. Number two for me is always is going to be previous injury. That's a great yep. predict. Yep. Uh, if you ever read Martin Bissinger's book, Training Talks, he, yeah, I forget he was – I think it was John Keeley or Kylie from uh, Ireland. Robbie Burke gave me his number. But it, it, I, I, I question periodization. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know what I think – you're talking about the article 21st century periodization by, yeah. by, Ky yeah. Super yeah. bright guy, John Kiley, yeah. super bright. Sorry, buddy. Uh, please well, continue. Science, science is not absolute truth, Anthony. Yeah. Science is a, 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 a opportunity for us to question and continue to research what we don't know. The notion that you can precisely control a complex organism yeah. as multifactorial as human body control that outcome to me is ludicrous. I was reading an article last week about Bondarchuk having 23 to 30 some different periodization schemes based on the athlete, you know, and you could, you could go so deep into training athletes. Like Christian Thibodeau talks about neural typing Yep. for training yep. your athletes. You know, you, as you learn your athletes and this is why, and, and I have expressed this to our owner, Michael Bidwell and, you know, God bless the guy. Cause he's agreed with me. Uh, we call ourselves the odd couple. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to feel it. He's like Oscar. We'll tell you putting each other up. Uh, we're talking about consistency of this bottom floor. Okay. And it comes down to the same people are training our athletes over and over again. They're not getting the latest, greatest. We're not constantly changing strength staffs. If you look at what the Buffalo Bills have done, and Eric Shiano, he's been there forever. Yep. Uh, Jacksonville did it with Tommy Mazinski, and I, and I hope that – I would hope and pray that the Jacksonville Jaguars go back to rehiring Tommy because he deserves to be a coach on this level. And plus what makes him great is he played the game. Sure. Best coaches are people who played the game. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. I've tried done and I was a track sprinter. So I understand the application of speed and its value to the athlete. I also understand controlling volumes based on position. You can't ask a big guy to run the same volume as a skill guy. So when we talk about speed, and one of the questions you asked me was, you know, there's many possible definitions for speed and velocity. They can be interchanged. But sure. if you look at um, oh, what I want to say here, if you look at physics, yeah, uh, speed is the time rate at which an object moves along a path, yeah, and that path can be curved, it can be straight, doesn't matter, and velocity is the rate or direction of the object's movement. Sure. But they can be interchangeable in our world because you talk about speed and velocity in, in uh, sporting world, speed and velocity, everybody says the same thing. Speed is equivalent to velocity. Velocity yep. is distance divided by time. Yep. Uh, given distance, dist given distance, we cover, you cover, try to cover a given distance in a minimal amount of time. I just yep. say move as fast as possible from point A to point B. 
But speed occur, can be mentioned a lot of other things, speed endurance, speed strength, yep. action speed, decision-making speed. When we look at speed, Anthony, we look at acceleration, which is a skill and can be improved, those yep. first four steps. And we look at transitional acceleration, we look at max velocity, we look at acceleration, which I think more and more people we need to understand and, and spend more time on. And we think it of um, multi-directional or change of direction agility work. It's funny. I got my job at the University of Pittsburgh with then head coach Jackie Sherrill, who, who I love to death. And every time I, I get a chance to, you know, wish Coach Sherrill a happy birthday or, you know, Merry Christmas on Facebook. And I don't do Facebook, trust me. I don't do most of that nonsense. Um, I, always, I always remember to say thank you because yeah. the guy gave me my career yeah. in a time in 1980 when no strength coaches were hired. He had the vision to go out and hire me. He hired me when I graduated, which ended April. He did not get permission from administration. Uh, he hired me and paid me out of his own pocket till the end of Jan, July. When he finally got permission, I received my first paycheck at the end of August. Uh, but I always credit Jackie with giving me my profession and, and, my, and my job. But, you know, back then we did not, we did not know a lot, but I always make sure to reach out to Coach Earl and say, thank you. Uh, for what you've done. But, you know, my my background was in track and field. And the way he found out about me was I played with a kid who still holds the interception record for four years and for a season. Bob Jury played at my high school. And I had fallen in love with pit football when he went to play there. And he asked me to help. And back, back in that day, there was no combines. It was a, a pro scout would call you on a Friday night and say, I'll be there Saturday morning. You have to show up. He'd call you on a Monday afternoon. I'll say, I'll be there Monday afternoon. You have to make your way up to the stadium. You could be running 40s five days in a row. They didn't give a shit. They didn't care. They were just wow. showing up to work you out individually. So Bobby had asked, started asking me to work with him on his 40-yard dash. And the first thing I did was I would mark out his first three to four steps to develop consistency. Because you can't run a good 10, you ain't going to run a good 20 which is not going to set you up for a good 30 or a good 40. So we give our guys different cues for acceleration work and max velocity, and we approach them differently. I stay mm -hmm. out of that transitional phase because that just profoundly confuses them. And, you know, you got to keep it as simple as possible for everybody. Uh, sure. We can we could sit here and divulge or dive down into some great stuff as far as speed is concerned. If you've ever – I've watched every one of Dan Papp's videos. I was blessed that – Two weeks before I was off, the, the week, when I was offered his job, two weeks before coming here, I had reached out to Frank Rizzo, who was my one of my interns at Pitt, who's now a sprint hurdle coach at Iowa State. And I asked Frank to get in touch with Dan Path for me, if I could just come out. And within two weeks of landing in Arizona, I was out at Altus, which is what uh, was called World Athletic Center at the time. And I didn't ask him a question. I just watched him coach for the first two weeks I went out there. Guy is an amazing observationist and problem solver. Yeah. That's all I want to do is watch him coach. And I was watching his videos. I still go back and read all of Charlie Francis's stuff yep. because I'm continuing to learn from a late great coach. I have Hank Krajinov's speed book. I have all great of, book. Yeah, Path has written. I've had all stuff that um, James Ralph the Thinker Smith. I know you have James. James yeah, I was fortunate enough. What well, are you talking about? A bright man. Oh, I know. James, Brilliant. Is ahead of everybody. Yep. You know, and there'd be times we'd be sitting in my office talking and I'd be like, all right, time out. I got, I got to take a mental break. <laughs> <laughs> I got to take a mental break. But, you know, I had enough confidence in James as I to my assistants here that, you know, this year what I'm going to start is Mark, who you met, uh, who answered the computer for me, is now going to start writing the strength programs for our skill guys. I still write all the speed and acceleration programs. And I just got Bill Parisi's book at the Combine, which I've already started diving into. But I don't write an acceleration program or look at Max Lossi until I send it over to Chidi and Enye. But I get his input all the time. And if our guys are out of the building, you know, I put down a list when we send programs home. Because like I said, we send stuff home that I recognize certain people that you can go train with, that we recognize as being in line with what we do. Of course, Mike, yeah. Ryan Flaherty at Nike, Mike Dango at Freak Strength uh, over in um, Jersey. You know, Lauren Landau has a great training facility in Denver. There's some great people out there. So there's some great PTs like Derek Samuel, Mike Hope. 
I mean, I'm fortunate to be in Arizona where I had Stu McMillan. Yeah. I had Chidi. I had Andreas. I had Jason Helter. I went out to Dan's, invited me to, you know, the poolside chat. I had dinner one night with me, Milo, uh, Dan Paff, and Carlos, Carlos Bocelli. Uh, no, Dr. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about Andre Bocelli. Uh, Carlos Bouchard. Is that what I'm saying? Uh, it's not Boucher. Uh, Boucher. Uh, oh, I, I know who you're talking about. I, yeah, I believe. About that. I have a picture of him. He in the weight room when he came over to visit. Is it Martin uh, Bush? Uh, is it Martin or Carlos? Carlos. It's Carlos okay, Bouchelli. 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 Okay. That's what it is. Okay. I sat there taking notes the entire time. Listen to these three guys. Two. You, you, it's funny. You 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 posted something to, to congratulate. Uh, or excuse me, not you, uh, Stu McMillan posted a, a, a picture of you congratulating on your, on your strength and conditioning, uh, 2021 strength coach of the year in the NFL, by the way, congratulations. And I replied and said, what, what a, an outstanding accomplishment. And, uh, you know, he's been doing this since I was in diapers and it's always someone I looked up to. And Stu responded back and said, yeah, he said, you know, he's been to several poolside chats. And I said, every single time he comes, it literally is pages of notes. You just sit there taking notes, yeah. taking, he said, Anthony, he said you wouldn't believe it just note yeah. taken after note which is which is fantastic it's it's something and i i've credited you i, I talked with you about this before um this one of my notebooks full of notes and this is notes that are i took um joel jameson conditioning course class great, great class here for matt jordan's matt jordan uh yep at the Kane sports institute in calgary yep. all his force plate i took force his plate. yep they're cressy's uh, yep. shoulder course. Yep. So, you know, I, I think there's some very, very, in the people. there's people out there are so far ahead of me that I'm just trying to catch up on a daily basis. Like, and like you, all, all yep. you can do is you can try to get better every day because if you limit your knowledge, you limit your abilities, limit your abilities, you limit the development of your athletes. And what's your yep. job? Yep. You know? So I think I look at everything, what everybody's trying to do. Zach Ertz was our tight end this year. And he had a, a, his guy he still uses from college, Shannon Turnley. I said, let me see some of the workouts. He said, for what? I said, that's how I learn. Yep. He looked at me kind of quizzical. He goes, are you serious? I'm like, yeah. What do you think I learned? You think, I'm, you think I just stopped learning? I said, I'm yep. old. I ain't dumb. I know I'm going to learn. So, and I made notes. There's notes all over my uh, desk here for when, when the, some of the questions that you asked me about. Yep. Yep. I think every day is an opportunity for you to learn. I, you, know, you can read 10 pages a day. I understand that. I will tell you this during the season, 10 pages, that first page is just a precursor for a nap. You know, <laughs> my, head, my head's bobbing after being here, you know, then <laughs> you know, with, with guys. And I'm fortunate I have two great assistants because I really get involved very extensively with all return to play. So when an ACL is, Five months post op here. Guess who gets it? Yep. I, I did JJ Watts, and with the help of Brett Fisher and Chad Cook, obviously, did his rehab the last four weeks before he stepped on the field in that first playoff game. He was Fantastic. amazing. He's still with me constantly, and he stayed here the entire off season, which I, I love having him around, Captain America, as we call him around yep. here. But he's a great influence on our young guys. I was going to say, yeah, big he's time. On my toes, you know, and he makes me look good. To be honest, great athletes make average coaches look very good. Yeah. You know, when I was at the University of Pittsburgh, my first 10 years, my, I'm sorry, my first three years, Anthony, we were 11 and 1 three years in a row. You know what the hardest thing I did? Open a door and turn the lights on. Because 14 <laughs> of those guys, I believe, 14 were drafted in the first round. What did uh, my friend Fergus Connolly say? You want to win at the college level, recruit good players. You want to win at the pro level, buy good players. <laughs> Not that hard. <laughs> <laughs> right criteria most the most overlooked criteria is still the ability to play the game oh you're only as good as the yeah, guys getting off the bus right yeah <laughs> there's not one drill at the combine that's relevant to the sport of american football they so, give you a test but they give you the questions yep not too hard to prepare for well to contrast that in the national hockey league we don't even have our combine test in which the environment it's played <laughs> We're not even, we have nothing on the ice. Exactly. <laughs> so go figure. <laughs> Here's what I always tell coaches. Turn a film on. Can he yeah. play football? It's Because I've seen great athletes. I've seen guys who weren't great athletes but loved the game. And one of those I always refer to is I was at the University of Pittsburgh, a kid named Jerry Osaski. He's in his 
13. Now he's been there as long as Mike Tomlin has been the head coach of Pittsburgh Service as our linebacker coach. Jerry O was only recruited by two schools, us and CMU. He came a 195 pound linebacker. If he broke a five flat 40, he was running downhill. <laughs> every time that you turn the film on, Anthony, wherever the ball was, there was Jerry making a tackle. Play 10 years in the NFL. It's so interesting, right? Because in team sport, it's the same. Like it's, I, re- I read an interesting book called The Tyranny of Metrics. And I have five pillars of, of what I think b- before I measure something, before I want to measure it. One of it's utility versus significance. And it talked about utility versus actual what matters utility. And, and the, the author said many times uh, we can we confuse the low hanging fruit with a bountiful harvest. And in this case, the inputs, vertical jump, running in a straight line, those are all relatively easy to measure. The hardest right. things to measure start from the scoreboard and work backwards. Timing, space, uh, a hockey sense or football sense. Those Temple things are- Awareness of the sport. Those things are almost impossible to measure, right? You have to have a 6.5% psychological output for to equal one percent optimal pr- improvement in performance wow the guys who don't watch film you're not going to improve much physically yeah you, you have what you have and still you start studying film and i've seen some of our guys around here look at film all day long you need buddha baker is one of the best athletes i've ever been around but he's a student in the game he yes. PhD. Same with Chandler Jones. We'll be on the floor in a weight room work on. Chandler's grabbing DJ Humphrey saying, how would you block this? You know, and he's going home through movement patterns on the floor because he's consumed with becoming the best that he can be, which is why he's been in the league so long and been an all pro. Uh, let me ask you this uh, total off the cuff question, but uh, I, I find it interesting. We talk about this idea too, like, you know, it's as strength and conditioning coaches, practitioners, like again, I guess you can easily measure what we do. You got someone stronger, but do you feel like uh, as you've evolved as a coach, it, it's, it, you talked about technical, tactical, psychological, physical, but do you think some of the best coaches really have a thorough understanding of, of the, the, the biomechanics isn't the right word. Like, uh, you know, watching that video, are you able to, to, to see that and be able to, to, to see these things and, and, and possibly, um, uh, not a, not adjust your programs accordingly, but have that understanding where you're able to talk to the player. Not the I, and you're not taking the coach's job. That's not what I'm saying. But I mean the importance right. of the importance of really in a, the X's and the O's, the technical and the tactical elements of the game. Do you feel that's important as a strength coach as well? I do, and I'm biased, but I, I'm curious as to your thoughts. I think the entire process of tank sports mastery. Even though they say we only have control over one element, which is physical, I disagree with that because yes. we have influence on those other three. And those other influences are the ability to notice, to train our athletes to their strengths, but notice those weak weaknesses and fill in the gaps to help bridge the gap and help bring up those weaknesses. Sure. And to me, Andy, you'll never be able to train specific to the sport. You'll never be able to recreate the biomechanical, nor physiological rate of force development, rate of force development, rate of cutting central nervous system that occurs on a field in a weight room or anything yeah. we do. Everything we do is very generic, very general. Yeah. We start off, when you talk about speed, I start off with acceleration right away. Yeah. After a two-week block of GPP, I start right into acceleration work. And it's only 10 yards, and people say, why do you got acceleration work right away? I said, well, first of all, if you look at a high CNS scale, you're going 10 meters, 60% of max velocity. It's not real intense. Yep. And we put in place before then what we call sled marching without arms, with arm action, where we can mimic the lower leg action of acceleration, but a slow controlled environment. Yep. I think one or must remember that we're training sportsmen. And as sportsmen experiences develops development, strength, power, muscular growth, their levels, their level, their levers are going to change. Yeah. So the motor pattern for acceleration and max velocity is going to change drastically. Why are you holding off on acceleration max velocity work? At least start acceleration work right away to account for that. So in the annual plan, it has to be readily in place at all times. Without direct acceleration or speed training, the motor patterns the athlete has developed uh, via his strength and his power training may significantly change or drastically change 
from previously developed sprint movement mechanics. Yeah. So everything has to be kept in place. I think it's a mistake to hold it off to the very end. We start right away. We start off with very generic or general change of direction. We do it sub-maximally. And the only reason, I, and we do change the direction because even though it's programmed, planned, and pattern, even though it's general and generic in nature, it still exposes the tissue and structures to those forces that may be encountered in the actual competitive activity. Um, and we start off sub-maximal so they can secure things. We start off with our tempo day, a cut at 90 degrees, a cut at 45. The next time we come and do tempo work, we'll do a cut at 135 and a reverse pivot drill. But we, and then we'll start to introduce them maxim, maximally as we introduce generic change of direction drill sub-maximally. Okay. Everything kind of just bleeds into the other. What really bridges the gap for me is obviously practice because we can do, we can talk about agility where you have to uh, respond to an external stimuli of physical accurately. Listen, just because you do a generic change of direction at the end of the change of direction, you, you throw a ball in them. That's not sports specific. Sure. So there was a guy, and my wife's son has a uh, training center in Buffalo, New York. And I'm not going to get into how I feel about that city, but it's not good. <laughs> but there's a guy there who competes with him who runs a, um, a performance center where he has hockey players jump on a box with a stick in their hand and calls it sports specific. I'm like, oh boy, here we go yep. again. Yep. They spend an inordinate amount of time on a foot ladder with a stick in their hand or a baseball glove on a hat on their hand or a baseball hat in their head and he's calling it sports specific. Yep. Well, it's not. Yep. Uh, there is, like I said, dynamic correspondence, which Berkeley Shansky talked about, you know, amplitude, direction of movement, dynamics of effort, uh, rate of time, rate of rate of time of max force production, regime of work, and there's one more in there, and there's dynamic correspondence. And there is transfer of training, which is dynamic correspondence, which are movements that are going to either in part or in whole be specific to the sport that enhance upon acquired motor qualities. But to me, like I said before, the best is to do the movement with great intention. Sure. All this other stuff is, no, this is specific to the sport. Well, no, it's not. Specific to the bench press, jumping rope specific to jumping rope. That yep. run around that cone, cone is specific to run around that cone. Just because you had a back pedal and throw a ball at him, doesn't mean it's specific to defensive backs. And sure. that's what I think that's where the general public and everybody gets very confused on. And especially guys in the advanced level, you got to practice your quality. You got to practice those qualities. You got to practice your skills. That's what's going to make you better at your skills on this level. Nothing in the weight room I'm going to do it, babe. All I'm trying to do is keep you healthy and get you from game to game because the longest period of time I get to train you, Anthony, is when the technical, technical, psychological aspect of components of sporting activity take precedent and you're most beat up. Speaking of that, uh, I'm just curious. We do this um, in season, but our game demands are very different than yours. We talked about this idea of managing versus development. So in season in the NFL – are you still working on qualities like acceleration and top speed, or is that taken care of at practice and at games? At the end of our dynamic warm-up, we ask our guys to do two accelerations from a half kneeling position. Okay. It's not it's maybe 10 yards. You know, okay. half of them fudge it, half of them, half of them fudge the dynamic warm-up, to be honest with you. So <laughs> and, and I got a great young man in Evan Louder who works very closely with Jamie Hefner, who I can't say enough. He's my favorite Aussie uh, from Catapult. And actually sitting with Coach Kingsbury and Kenny Bell, coach's assistant, every Monday to plan out practice. So Monday is more of a low-tempo recovery, longer-distance day yep. as far as routes. And every day it's getting ramped up. So Friday is what we call Fast Friday. There's a walkthrough, but we're on and off the field with high-speed work in an hour. And a prime for Sunday. And sure. one thing Evan has done is – he looks at our, our max velocities at the end of the year, and there's no real big drop off. We're still having guys in practice hitting 20, 21 miles an hour. Wow. So when you talk about uh, the length of the season, it's not hit, it's not who's the freshest at the end of the season, Anthony. It's he's who's the least fatigued. So Everybody, well put. <laughs> when, we, when I meet with the team at the beginning of the year, you know, Cliff gives me that chance. I tell everybody, welcome to the last day of feeling good. <laughs> you ain't going to be hundred percent at the end of the year. We'll try. How are you going to minimize or manage the fatigue you're going to incur? 
that's up to you. We'll we'll take care of you in the weight room. You know, the guy comes to me and says, you know, buddy, I'm beat up. I don't feel like bench press pressing. I'm like, all right, we'll dumbbell bench. We'll do loaded push-ups. We'll do a machine press. It's still strength in the arms and a scapular plane. Who gives a shit what you do? Because I got to tell you, buddy, they're not going to put a um, power rack at the middle of the field before a game and say, let's have at it, folks. <laughs> go in fall camp. My skill guys, we don't do squat at all. We don't squat at all. I know that's blasphemy to a lot of people. Yeah. But I look at the hamstrings are already getting hammered and deceleration acceleration work and essentially loaded. The first movement of squat, especially for the glutes and hamstrings, it prevents the hips dropping out. It's the hamstrings and glutes, which are already getting a shit beat out of. Them. So you know what we do, Andy? We do concentric trap bar pulls, pull and drop. It's so funny. That's exactly. Hey, it's so interesting when you look at the subtle nuances that make a great program. Just looking at in season, taking certain exercises and eliminating them off your menu items because of delayed onset muscle soreness. To someone that doesn't have a super good knowledge of the subtle nuances, it might look like ah, it's just a regular program. But something like that you, that you just talked about. Back squat versus concentric only trap bar deadlift massively reduces eccentric as opposed to, you know, or a reverse lunge as opposed to a forward lunge. Maximally. One's acceleratory. One is slamming on the brakes. One's going to cause delayed onset muscle soreness and have an effect on the game. That's off the menu list. It's a subtle nuance, but it makes an elite program. Plus, you think about concentric work, it's just all blood flow. It's just helping promote recovery. I just want to get them to recover from next day so they can go out and do what they do. You know, Evan looks at our, our speed for every day. And if somebody breaks a new speed barrier, we tell the coaches there's now, and depending on age, because age has a lot to do with this, there's now a 24 to a 48 hour window where their hamstrings are going to be more susceptible to issues. You know, when people have hamstring problems and we know all the mechanics or all the reasons why hamstrings occur, we're never going to prevent them. I got news for everybody. That's not going to go away as long as we try to run fast, because like every injury, they're multifactorial and complex. Yep. They're systematic, biomechanical, uh, physiological, environmental circumstances, and just pure happenstance bullshit. Yep. We all have to account for that, and that will happen. But like I tell my guys, how are you going to minimize your fatigue? Are you taking care of yourself? Are you staying up till 2 in the morning playing video games, which is going to adversely affect you? With lat limited sleep, you know, sleep is one of the, pro the the best recovery methods we have, and the military's known that for years. And now all of a sudden, the world of athletics is just figuring that shit out. Yeah. Come on, people, it's been around for years. Everybody's looking for the all these secret answers, and what goes around comes around. There's nothing new out there, Anthony. What is old is just being regurgitated and is new. I remember doing. We used to call not the Nordics. We used to call them in high school Russian leans. And I had an intelligent enough track coach that would have us start to perform on a hill so we couldn't go all the way down. And then would decrease the inclination of that hill so we could do them flat. But I remember the first couple of times doing them, I lit my hamstrings up. It was <laughs> – it's not a new exercise. It's, sure. not, it's not the other reason why people – there's a lot of reasons why people can prevent – there's a lot of methods to help people prevent hamstrings, training them distally, training them proximally, training them in isometric or integrated position. Uh, Jay Schroeder talked about the value of isometrics back in the early two, late nine, uh, early 2000s when Adam Archuleta came out. So our, our program is heavily eccentric-based. It's heavily isometric-based. Uh, it's heavily uh, velocity and acceleration-based. We train our skill guys like Olympic sprinters. We train our big guys like Olympic hammer throwers. But everybody is exposed to max velocity and the max velocity contractions of the tissue. Even our, even our big guys will do flying tens. They won't do as many as our skill guys, obviously. And their volume of speed work is not what our skill guys is. And when we're into our acceleration phase, we're emphasizing more maximal strength work more single single jumps, more med ball throws as we move into our max velocity phase. Now we're going more unilaterals compared to bilateral work. Now we're doing multiple jumps, multiple bounds. Now we're doing more technical work. I mean, there's more technical work done in the beginning, but we're emphasizing less of the technical as we're getting more and more with running faster and faster. But everybody on this team is exposed to it. There's not one person that doesn't have to do some type of max velocity or just the volume difference because you're going to see an offensive lineman he's going to pull on the screen he's going to or or, or some uh, a play where he's called he's got to pull he's going to sprint up field 10 15 yards 
DJ Humphreys, our starting left tackle, came to me and showed me on, you know, watch, watch man this play. He literally pulls and sprints 15 yards up the field. Well, you have not exposed that tissue to that. I'll give two shits. I'll start again. Yep. Listen, I love Louis Simmons to death. Louis Simmons and Charlie Francis, I met both in 99, 1997, who changed my world. It was an epiphany. epiphany. You know, it was like I saw Jesus. But yep. um, you can talk about hamstring strength, but I've been to West Side and I've seen those guys. They're, they're ungodly strong, but they'll get challenging each other and they go out and run a, a 10 or 20 meter sprint. They're just five, and at least two of them will pop a hamstring because they have not exposed. The only reason the other three don't, they just got lucky. <laughs> right. You, I, I, I think Dan Cleather has a book. Uh, it's an excellent book called Force. It's all the biomechanics of force. He talks in it about impulse. He talks. He said we really need to, to be really picky with this, but we should not look at the force velocity relationship. It should be load velocity because we all see that pair. You know that like max effort strength and then yes. sprinting. The reality is the forces are the load on the tissues and the forces in sprinting far exceeds your back squat. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why, you know, Buffalo Bills said they, they eliminated squatting this season. Like, you don't have to eliminate it. Just look at the dose response. Yes. What's the on the bar, what's the response? My big guys, we box squat all season long, but it's not a very heavy load. Yes. It can't be because you're pushing against another 300-pound oh. man for 60, 70 plays a game. You're telling me you're not working maximal strength? No, and absolutely. Printing up field? Our skilled guys are running it. We, we see our guy, listen, uh, I watched one of our skill guys on special teams start to left end of the field, make a tackle on the right end of the field, and he was running at 20.4, 20.5 miles per hour and hit the, the return guy, blew his knee, and not, he was out before he even hit the ground. So wow. that's the forces that these guys create through the velocity they have that they're, they're running at and the forces they have to incur on the field. So you tell me, how is a guy, you're going to get injured. You're going to yep. get beat up, and especially in a chaotic, uncontrolled environment. You sure. have no idea where your head's on a swivel for 60 minutes every, every Sunday at the, at the elite level of athletics where everybody's great. I, I know it's a really like it can be a d depends type type of question, but you talk about this idea of training your your skill positions as Olympic uh, sprinters and and your O linemen as 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 hammer throwers. Uh, I, I, I'm not asking for a sprint program, but maybe how how large of distances would you expose your skilled players in? sprinting in, in, in the off season? I mean, is it a 30 meter distance? Would you have them go, would it be 40? It, it, like, what are your greatest distances to be able to expose the tissues? For example, you know, someone uh, catches the ball in a kickoff and, and runs down 90 yards sprinting. I know that's a very, very, not a high probability that it happens in football, but how, how far of a distance do you set for your skill players in terms of full out sprints? Depends on the position. Everybody must master 10 yards. Uh, will will gradiate the exposure to the to the stimulus over time. Yep. So, like I can tell you, this next block of training, we're going to an isometric block. We're still emphasizing maximal strength, bilateral movements, single jumps, med ball throws. Our skill guys will do accelerations the first week, five by ten and three by twenty yards. Now, if you're a gunner, that's a different story. Because yep. now we're going to work on curve running. Now we're going to work on longer distances. And I ask our special teams coach every year, give me the list of your top gunners. Because they're okay. going to have to do extra uh, longer distance. In, and we separate everything by acceleration and max velocity. Max velocity, we can take our skill guys out to a flying 20. And nobody's going to hold max velocity for more than 20 meters. That's impossible. I've seen the split times of all world record holders in 100 meters, and these are elite world record sprinters. These aren't us. We're, we're, despite our inefficient mechanics, we're fast athletes. So just a small technical increase in helping our athletes improve technically has a profound effect on securing that technique in periods of fatigue. It has a profound effect on our ability to move faster or generate, create greater speeds. But it all depends on position, all depends on okay. time of year. Uh, we'll start off all our acceleration work without any resistance. The resistance yep. is done in a weight room. Then we'll move to heavy chain resisted sprints. And I understand ground contact is going to be longer, but it allows them to develop greater propulsive forces. We'll go to contrast training. Our big guys will push prowlers. 
heavy and then have to sprint up field for five yards in any direction, forward, diagonally, or laterally. So it all depends on the position. It all depends on the time of year. Um, when they first all get here April 18th, you're looking at probably a 30 or team changes every year, Anthony. So now you're assessing people right away on the run. Uh, we do a brief uh, assessment with our guys from ankle mobility, hip internal external rotation, filter internal external rotation, uh, trunk rotation, ankle mobility is, as uh, and we just get an idea of where we have to target a lot of our training with certain guys. Their force plate jumped. Uh, we do a counter movement jump. Evan and I have talked about doing a unilateral side to side jump. We've talked about doing a single leg jump, uh, but those are only going to be guys that are prepared for it. Who spent the off season with us. We get Nord board. And again, the Nord board is just numbers. Sure. It's just an indication yep. of what we need work. Uh, most of the guys have not done a lot of eccentric training to begin with, especially slow eccentrics. So we progress from slow eccentrics to very rapid eccentrics closer to camp. But we look at all this and we actually, Anthony, have come up with a system uh, to correct asymmetries. So I will get a sheet. And there's one on my desk somewhere. We just did it the other day. Some guys, with what the sheet looks like. You'll see there's green, yellow. There's no red on there. So these guys are pretty good. The guys that have circled are guys that I have to correct. Uh, if it's 12% or under, uh, no, 15% or under, uh, Evan will green, pull fill in with a green block. If it's 15 to 20%, it's a yellow. Yep. And it needs attention. If it's above yellow, it's a red, and that's a panic situation. Yep. There are no predictors of injury. Uh, biggest predictor, again, as I said, is too much volume. And when I say volume, you got to remember, walkthroughs are still a load on the body. Sure. They have to be accounted for. Uh, the second is obviously previous injury, history of previous injury, guess predictive injury is what they do for previous injury. Some guys come here from other teams with an uh, injury history that reads like war and peace. But we <laughs> actually uh, have figured out uh, over time how to correct, you know, peak landing, uh, concentric impulse, uh, eccentric braking, and eccentric acceleration rate of force development. And we found the two greatest indicators, I didn't say predictors, I said indicators, are eccentric deceleration rate of force development and eccentric braking. Notice the first word in both of those, eccentric. Eccentric, yeah. So uh, we've come up with a way to correct those issues. And again, we get four to five jumps on 60 guys every month, every three to four weeks. Yep. So looking at five jumps times 60 guys, that's 300 jumps over four, four months. That's over five months. That's over 1,500 jumps we get to look at. Yep. Now, when I first – and we've been doing this for eight years, and I started with Anthony Paroli, and then Anthony uh, left to go to Mississippi State and then with BA to Tampa. And I said, listen, send me the highest anxiety guy you got. I need to be in focus, but I need to be as anxious as your ass is. So I talked to Evan first time on the phone. I said, he's fucking hired. That's my guy. First time I met Mark Taylor when he walked in when um, Roger Kingdom decided he was going to go with Anthony to Tampa is um, I, I just had to meet with Mark for five minutes. I'm like, he's the fucking guy. We're going to bring two other guys in, but I'm just telling you. And I went to Cliff. I said, I already got it. And Cliff agreed with me. Coach Kingdom agreed with me at the time. But, uh, we've been looking at force plates for a long, long time. Yep. Uh, we've done stuff on there for upper body isometrics and depth drops because uh, our first, obviously our first block of training is teach our guys to absorb force because you can only create what you can absorb. So we go through force play testing. Uh, when guys are injured, especially ACLs, the minute they're able to jump, they jump. And then that force play testing guides your actual training. Yep. Sends you in the direction they need to be. But those are the two greatest indicators we have. And, you know, we first started doing this, I used to panic. Oh, my God, look at this. We're in camp and look at all these asymmetries. So I called Ryan Flaherty, who's the head of Nike Performance. And we, I used to bring Ryan to camp with us every year until he got the Nike job and could no longer come. And he said, buddy, one thing you're failing to forget, you're failing to account, account for is fatigue. And he's right. You know, half his fatigue. I'm like, holy shit, why am I so dumb? He was right in front of my face. Fatigue is going to affect everybody differently. And, you know, talking to Milo one day, I have a certain amount of volume that I'll do with corrections and asymmetries. 
that over a course of time, we've been able to correct them and get guys back to where they should be, which I think has helped us tremendously as far as avoiding issues. At the end of the year, I always sit down with our trainers and I wrote it on the grease board in Mark and Evan's office where we need to direct some of our training to this year. High ankle sprains, posterior subluxations of the shoulder. Those need to look, be looked at more exclusively. Uh, we don't do a lot. We don't get real fancy yep. with sports uh, science. We catapult force plate and org board. That's it. Like and that. Evan helps coach design uh, practice schedule. I think if you get too much, you can't see the forest through the trees. And a lot of these people are collecting data and they're like, what are you doing with it? Oh, I don't know. We just collect it. And I've had guys come from other teams and we force play them. They go, okay, I know, no, here, you got to do this because here's what the force play show me. Was, Never did that before. You know, yep. so it takes more time on our part. Of course, yes. And it takes a lot of time for me to sit down and look at all the metrics you can establish and get. And I'm constantly looking stuff up on force plates. But I think it's been a great asset to our program in helping us under, understand and identify indicators for our guys as we move forward. But again, the greatest indicator we all have to account for is, like I said, how are you managing your fatigue? What are you doing on your part? It ain't my responsibility. It's your body. I'll show you. Yep. You're the one that has to do it. If you get out, you're out to practice and you're that guy that runs in and gets a shower just to get out of here, you can be home by four o'clock. I can't help you. That's Absolutely. your mistake. I can find you. We can find you, but you still got to step up. That's why I'm a firm believer in this. Anthony, it's a professional athlete or elite athlete. You should never stop training. Now, when I say that, yep. there's periods of intensive work and extensive work. There's recovery periods. So one thing we did here, I think abrupt, abruptly stopping anything is very detrimental to the system, especially current and functional adaptable reserves. I think when you get to the end of the season, you just abruptly stop. That's one of the worst things you can do for every system in the body because the body is a system of systems with our own uh, checks and balances. We're an interdependent matrix system. No system works independent of the other ones. And I think stopping anything is equivalent to slamming your car into a brick wall going 200 miles an hour. <laughs> nice car you bought. Why are you doing that to your body? Sure. So we put together a recovery program from the season. It's based on Charlie Francis's bike tempo work. It's yeah. done for two weeks, maybe three weeks. And then we move into some band work and mobility work. But you should never stop because the lotion is in the motion. The body will heal faster from movement than it will just laying on a table, sitting around doing nothing. Because I, I caution everybody about this. You sit around on that table doing nothing. The body dives deeper down to the rabbit hole of recovery. When you disrupt the rhythm of stress and adaptation and the body dives down into that rabbit hole recovery, you don't know how long it's going to take to reboot the system. If you've ever heard Dan Path list speak, Sometimes, you know, you've got guys that are taking two years off, reboot the system in two weeks. Yeah. Highly specific to the individual. I can't answer that question. You know, just like coaches, listen, I write a workout up every day. That was my thought process at that time. Though there is, we get on the floor, I'm like, yeah, we ain't fucking doing that. We ain't doing that. Move this to there. <laughs> the map is not the terrain. <laughs> just like coaches have a game plan. What do you think they do at halftime? Yep. They make adjustments. They make so adjustments true. on the field. They go up to the box. What are you seeing? Here's what we're seeing now because you got the greatest minds in the world scheming against each other all week long for 16 weeks, 16 and 24 weeks. You got to be able to make a change as an adjustment. If you're just going because it's on paper, I think you're making a drastic mistake. One of the ways we assess our guys, and you can do jumps, and you know, eventually guys are going to get tired of jumping before you ask them every week. And we could do a practice squad, which I've done in the past, but just watch them when they warm up when they come in for a workout. Yeah. They use the foam roller as a, a pillow or a cushion, and they're just laying on their eyes and <laughs> roll back into their head. And you put music on and music isn't doing it. You better be ready to change and go to plan B, but keep plan B as close to plan A as possible. Sometimes you got to go to plan C. Yep. You give them what they need, not what they want. So it's Eero's opportunity to assess them constantly. If they're a bunch of chatty caddies, they're ready to go. If they're Absolutely. not a bunch of chatty caddies, you better be able to change. You better be willing to change. Just don't, you can't be that tough guy. You know? That's one yeah. of the complaints I have on college football nowadays is kids are just over-volumized. When they get here, they're so beat up. 
They're con so concerned with the load on the bar. Listen, if you become, everybody's so concerned about force output, force output, got to increase force output. Let me give you a hint there, Sparky. <laughs> you just become more mechanically efficient, biomechanically efficient, you're going to produce greater force because the body's not going to have a governor on it. It's not going to protect itself. It's mm -hmm. going to be a mechanically efficient where it can produce the maximum amount of the force it can with every system working in conjunction. But if you're not mechanically efficient, if you're just getting under a bar to lift weight and just throw another plate just to put another plate on the bar. I think that's a that's a that's a huge mistake. That that's a red flag. It yep. really, is. and we try to avoid that at all costs. Here, I'm more concerned with having somebody do things proper. That's why we go through the eccentric isometric blocks because they're a great way. Think about a great way to teach technical skill. And every exercise has a technical skill. But think about this. Corrective exercises, which are everybody, it's with the flavor of the month, flavor of the year. <laughs> every muscle in the human body becomes a flavor of the month. I started in this profession first. It was the transverse abdominis. Then it was the multifidus. And then it was the rectus. Then it was the glute mean, glute minus. And it was the patella. Now it's the anterior fib, you know, every fucking month or something new. <laughs> How about this? Just train balance in your program. Yep. So I'm asking you to do, just be, have a balanced approach. Don't overemphasize one thing. But these corrective exercises, which to me, limit the variability the athlete has to solve motor problems or limits the options the athlete has, are really just the brain's way of trying to find a way, a route around what it perceived to be a danger. The brain is the ultimate driver, but it's an organ that lives in a cave. The brain is always going to do the best to protect itself, especially energy-wise. So if the brain is going to perceive the external environment one of two ways, Anthony, it's either a threat or it's safe. Yeah. There's no middle ground. So a lot of times I think compensations are just that, just the brain trying. If you get the brain's attention, you can correct a lot of things. I think isometrics are great for that. You know, there's a lot of people, there's this, uh, I forget where it's that thing called, Square. it's a program called Square One, which I'm starting to look more and more into, you know, but there are no magic things out there. There really, there really are. I think part of, a lot of the responsibility has to fall on the player, but nobody wants to blame the player. And today's professional athletes want more time off, want more money, and it become progressively lazier. So wow. in the days when you and I grew up, or when I grew up, it was about uh, responsibility and accountability. Now everybody's talking about rights and privileges. Well, let me tell you this. You have the privilege to be part of the NFL, <laughs> the highest level of sporting activity. I and love you this. You have the right to fucking train. That's Absolutely. the rights and privileges. You yep. don't have any others. Yep. Those are your rights and privileges. Your right to train, to, to do what others aren't doing, make more money than anybody I ever see. Because it's a very small window. Most sure. guys don't see their second contract. And you have the privilege. Yeah. Every day I tell myself, I, I'm privileged to be part of the NFL. Yeah. I'm privileged. Most yeah. people don't look at it that way anymore. I, uh, I think that is a Lou Holtz quote, uh, I believe. But uh, what a, what a <laughs> couldn't agree with you more. That's what I stole uh, from. I, 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 is, that, is it Lou? Was that right? Whoa, what a, oh, man, I've read several of his books. Unbelievable yeah. leader. Um, I want to respect your time, Coach. I, I, I literally blinked and, and, and I, I told you an hour. I just want to thank you for taking the time. I told you this on the onset, but I, I want to tell all the listeners now. Thank you for being an absolute leader in our field. You've been doing this since I was in diapers. The information that you put out when you speak, you're passionate, you're purposeful, you have intent. Uh, and I, I can't thank you for the time because you've, uh, you've had an indelible mark on not only the way I think as a critical thinker, critical rationalist, but the way I program. We lost that ability too, to critically oh, think. Oh, don't even get me started on this. <laughs> the, 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 that, that could be, trust me when I say this, from... <laughs> From from the research that we're putting out right now to 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 looking over the research and what it means to critically to, to actually have how about this one and I could go on and, and critique is how we grow criticism is how we grow constructive criticism is how we grow yet not many people want that uh, we want reinforcement listen I have assistants that are smarter than me yep I don't want a bunch of mini me's running around because I really don't like me <laughs> I don't want a bunch of <laughs> I don't want a bunch of mini meetings right now. I want people that I say, because Anthony did that, Mark has done that, Evan is always telling me new things about the force plate. 
you know, because as a head guy, you can't know everything. That's why I say, all right, Mark, you're doing a nutritional shit. I, I don't want to hear it. You think it's a good idea? Discuss it with me. Tell me what you're going to do. Great. Evan, you got to, just let me know about force plates. Let me know about catapult. Let me know what's going on in practice. That's great because I'm so involved in the rehab and return to play process. Yep. And meeting with our team physicians, meeting with, you know, and coordinating with our trainers and writing programs for everybody. And we must write a hundred different individualized programs based wow. on what we see with the individual. And that takes up, yeah, it takes up a lot of time. And we run lean here. We only got three of us. You know, Jeez. most people have two guys in sports performance or sports science only. That's all they do. Those guys have four or five guys on the floor. When Evan comes in after practice, he's collecting all the catapults himself and put them in the computer. It's only Mark and I on the floor. That's it. There was wow. one day last year, uh, we had what we called a, a, an off-season like for four or five, six practices. I forget what it was. And one day, 55 guys came in the weight room and there was only me and Mark. At one time. I was like, ah, fuck, this is like the old days. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like when I first started in 1980 and didn't have any assistance. You know, you'd line people up and your stretch lines would be 100 yards long because you had 125, 130 guys at camp. And you were Jeez. trying to count for all that. But, uh, you know, all I've ever tried to do is what you try to do every day is get better than I was the day before. You know, yep. we ask our athletes to get better. Why aren't we asking ourselves to get better? What article have you read lately? What have you done? Are you, you know, in this league, I could just write one program and just send it out every year, same thing. Send out, regards state, same thing, same thing, same thing. Every year I reach, I change the acceleration program. I change our programs as I learn more. There isn't one thing you've learned in a year that help, can help make your program better. Why are you just copying and pasting the program you sent out 10 years ago. So I've been here this one on my ninth year, every off season program, you'll see drastic changes and differences. Not so much drastic, but subtle changes as we've sure, learned more sure. things we can do better. And based on what we've seen from an injury standpoint, you got to address that. You got to think, Oh, we got to find a way we got to do our part. So every day we come in to do our part. Like, uh, what's who's the head coach from new England. Jeez. Oh man. So have Bel Belichick, we, Belichick. we just do our job. Just do your job. Not asking you to do anything else. Just do your fucking job. That's it. So we try and do our job better than everybody else. Uh, we'll continue to try and learn. My desk looks a, a mess. You know, I've always I always stole Albert Einstein's quote: "Cluttered desk is sign of a cluttered mind." What then is an empty desk a sign of? I'll give you a hint: <laughs> empty. <laughs> I think not questioning anything because you don't want to critically think. You just want somebody to pat you on the back. Tell you, you did a great job and I agree with everything you do. It's not how things work. You know, I, I after two weeks, listen, I tell Evan, just get the program out because I'll change it again. If you don't get the program out, we're going to be here all week, the next two weeks, pre for the previous two week block because you try to outthink yourself. So you go back to what you did in years before and you go and you call people. And then at some point in time, you sit down for me and say, okay, send it out. It's got to go out because if you don't, <laughs> it ain't never going out. Yeah. So I don't sit down and write the same program year to year. Our acceleration program has already changed this year based on my conversations with cheating, based on going back and listening to Dan Penn, based on reading stuff from Charlie Francis, based on seeing stuff that Ryan Flaherty has done in the past, based on just – and, yeah, there are some good people on Instagram that I follow. Mm -hmm. I look at it, I'm like, why didn't I think of that? You know? Mm -hmm. You know, we all go through that. But I think sure. if you really aspire to be a, a, a effective coach, like I tell my wife, the day I stop getting nervous for game day and the day I don't come home from a game exhausted, and I don't do anything. We're there, me, Mark, and ever there four hours before. We set up all the foam rollers, bands, get guys ready to get them warmed up. And, you know, we hang out. But when I get on the plane, I have restless leg syndrome. You know, my legs won't, won't stop. They, you don't sleep that because you're trying to wind down and the next day, the next two days are very big days training wise for us. So my staff and I go from Sunday morning uh, to Wednesday afternoon as hard as we can. We don't get our first break till Wednesday after practice or we can sit down and breathe because you got guys coming in out Monday, and Wednesday and on, a, on Monday and Tuesday on the fly and the trainers are coming to you after, you know, injury check. This guy can do that. He can't do that. Do this with him. And, you know, again, there's only three of us. Yeah. So maybe I may have this mark outside warming guys up doing tempo work. And yes, I believe in a development aerobic system. 
and uh, I may be inside with Evan doing things. So there's a lot that goes on. But yeah, from Sunday morning, Anthony, to Wednesday afternoon, we don't take a breath. And then all of a sudden you exhale on Wednesday afternoon. You got Thursday and Friday practice. And, and Saturday, you know, when you travel, if you're not, you get that kind of walk through on Saturday, you can go home and relax Saturday afternoon. Then you're yeah. back up. The day I stop getting nervous, the day I don't come home exhausted from a game is the day I quit. And I'll tell you this, in closing, my mother is still alive at 89. God bless her because she rose, raised five boys by herself on a bank teller salary. We literally had nothing growing up. Uh, but she retired from as a bank tower at the age of 84. Oh. 80 fucking years old. Jeez. So there, there's, it's, well, there's already what's structured in my DNA. And I tell people all the time, there's two factors that determine everything in life. One of those is genetics. Can't do nothing about it. It's passed on from generation to generation. You know, Ralph Mann talks about eight performance limiting factors we all, we all possess. Yeah. And we only have control over one of them. And that's developmental. But the second is your environment. That's how you play the cards nature has dealt you. Nature don't deal all of us the same cards. And that goes back to the fact that we're a tire. I'm, I may not be a Pirelli. I may be a bargain basement big O. But how am I going to take care of the wear and tear on my tread so I can accomplish what I want? And nowadays, you know, those two words, hard work, yeah, mm. nobody wants to do that anymore. You can just get a stimulus check from some goofball who's sitting behind a white desk in a White House. You know, it's, it's just gotten absurd anymore. I don't want to divulge into politics. It's not my expertise. But uh, <laughs> I got a lot to say about that maybe one day. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity to be on your show. Uh, Thank you for the book. Again, it's just like I sent you the letter. I sent you a t-shirt. Just uh, gave me an opportunity to learn. And I appreciate opportunities to learn because I don't know it all. Yeah. I never will know it all. That's what makes this so fascinating. Our profession is so fascinating to continue to learn and continue to find things out. You know, to me, the next step in optimal optimizing performance is going to be the brain. Yeah, You haven't even tapped into the brain yet. And the brain is the ultimate governor. I'll leave you this. There's a thing called the cocktail party theory. And to me, you know, if you've ever read about the brain, the brain is always like 60 seconds ahead of you in time. Yep. If you and I are talking and I perceive you to be boring. I can still carry on a conversation with you, but listen in on somebody next to me and still understand what they're saying. Sure. So the brain is capable of a lot of things that we just don't even understand yet. I truly believe at some point in time, I'll never see it. The same bullet has been clocked at 27.8 miles per hour. At some point in time, a human being is going to break 30 mile an hour more. Jeez. I won't be here, but that's going to happen. It's going to be years from now, but I'm a firm believer, especially as we learn, you know, to me, the, the greatest athletes in the world do three things better than everybody else. Number one, they know how to use the ground. The ground is a force plate. Number two, they can relax their antagonistic muscle groups 200 times faster than a normal person. Number three, they could create those forces in ungodly short amounts of time. That's And they're able to do abnormal things normally. That's what separates the elite athlete from the not so elite. And we're not all going to be elite. Wow. And there's a lot to be said for genetics, especially when you talk about speed. Doesn't mean speed and acceleration can't be taught. Yeah. But you have to be mis, uh, very misguided to think anybody can run fast. You can get faster. And you can improve your existing speed, but there's still a big genetic component to it. I don't care what I do. I'm not going to be able to have that unique wind up and delivery that you yeah. Usain Bolt does. And, you know, to me, sprinting is nothing more than contracting, relaxing and high levels of uh, the neuromuscular apparatus and musculoskeletal system in a coordinated effort. You ask the normal person around 40, Anthony, that's the first thing they're going to do. You're going to strain. Yeah. Because true, display, true speed displays itself in a very relaxed, fluid movement. And I think the greatest thing in the world is watching somebody run fast in effortless abilities. Anyway, that's my, that's my thought. For this. Our guest today has been Coach Buddy Morris. Coach, thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate it, Anthony. Thank you very much. Of course. 